Hi, Stark Centeno, and uh, thank you for joining us at You've Got the Power. Uh, I've not been live for about six weeks or so, five and a half weeks. So it's great to be back. Uh, great to see you all and welcome you all into a live version. I've been doing, I had some things set up that were going out each week, so hopefully you saw those. And today we're going to cover an interesting topic, uh, hopefully answer a lot of questions as well. So uh, topic today is uh, CCI type 1D or rotational instability of the skull on the atlas. So as usual, I'll cover that topic. Uh, then uh, from there, we'll go to some questions. You can ask questions about that topic. You can ask questions about pretty much anything uh, you, you want to and happy to answer those questions. Again, purpose of the show is to make sure that patients can get questions answered. And more importantly, uh, that patients get educated. Uh, I did a blog this morning about some concerning stuff happening in a Mexican clinic. And, you know, it's very obvious to me as a physician and other physicians, when I look at a video to say, wow, that, that looks problematic for reasons A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. But it's harder for patients to see that without getting educated. And so that's one of the purposes of this show. Uh, so let's get started on a lecture while we let people uh, sort themselves out and get here. First, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And from there, uh, I will get started. So uh, topic today is CCI type 1D, rotational instability at C0, C1. And slideshow from beginning. Okay, CCI type 1D, rotational instability at C0, C1. So first thing is I'm back. I was gone for about six weeks. I thought I might get to one or two uh, Facebook Lives at odd times, but it never really worked out with regard to internet access and, and where we were. Obviously, it was on a sailboat the whole time. So um, sometimes we had good internet access, sometimes we didn't, uh, et cetera. But I'm back and uh, back to doing Facebook Lives on a regular basis now. So as you all know, I've developed a CCI typing system because each specific diagnosis and type of CCI requires that different ligaments are targeted. And today we're gonna to talk about CCI uh, type 1D. Let me pull up a pen here. So uh, again, the, the type 1 CCIs refer to C0, C1. And we'll be talking about 1D today. And this is rotational instability at C0, C1. So uh, let's draw that out here. So sc the skull is called C0. Uh, C1 is the atlas. So the C0, C1 area is between those two. And there are two joints, one on each side here. So this is one of those joints. And then there's another joint. Now, some of that joint stability is going to be due to the capsule of C0, C1 here. But there's also lots of other ligaments involved. We've got two sets of ligaments that go from the atlas down to the skull, one anterior, one posterior. Um, we've also got the alar ligaments, which aren't as involved here, but they do help bind one to the other. So that helps to bind the skull to C2, causing compressive force here at the atlas and C0, C1. So they are indirectly involved in what's going on here. Um, and in this case, the definition, and the only definition I can find out there is through Dvorak's work uh, way back when, 20 plus years ago, uh, looking at abnormal being defined as more than eight degrees of rotation on a rotatory CT scan. And this is what that would look like. So if you had a CT scan here, 
you would measure the angle here at uh, C0 for the rotation. And then you'd go down to C1 and measure the angle at uh, C1. And then you just subtract one from the other, 85 uh, degrees minus 75 degrees equals 10 degrees of rotation between the two. Hence, uh, that would be unstable. So that's how that works. And which ligaments are involved? We talked a little bit about the alar ligaments indirectly here, uh, the facet capsules we talked about. Also, uh, these ligaments, these lanto occipital ligaments, which I sort of drew in there, there are also ligaments up front here that I've talked about before, the lateral atlanto-occipital oblique ligaments, or the LAOL ligaments, uh, are involved. And those are only accessible by coming from the front here. So you can get the C0, C1 facet capsules, at least posteriorly, and the joint from, from going posterior. The ALAR is more of a PICL type approach, obviously. And the lateral, 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 lateral occipital ligaments you can get from posterior and the lateral anterior occipital oblique ligaments, you would need more of a PICL approach to get there. So that's how you get to those various ligaments. So really talking about those level four uh, posterior injections and the level five, um, obviously if you're getting extra motion at C0, C1, then you're probably gonna also have to inject the C0, C1 facet joint because that joint is getting beat up and that would be an ultra specialized injection using uh, fluoroscopy with digital subtraction angiography. Uh, and then obviously the PICL approach uh, that we talked about to get uh, all those ligaments from the front. So that's all I got for today. I wanted to keep it kind of short because I know we probably have lots of questions that have built up through the weeks here. So uh, let me stop sharing and uh, we'll get to those questions. Okay, uh, uh, Leslie, uh, yes, from the back. Uh, Maya, hello, what exactly is CCI? Can you please explain it and can it cause POTS when looking down? My neck side and from muscles tense up when I bend down and my heart rate increases. Uh, CCI is craniocervical instability. So what that means is that the head is not stable on the spine and the ligaments are damaged or stretched out that uh, hold those two together. Um, so can it cause POTS? Um, we certainly see CCI patients who have direct irritation of the vagus nerve and that uh, direct irritation of the vagus nerve can lead to uh, significant POTS-like symptoms. Uh, and that's because the vagus nerve helps to control the tone of the various arteries uh, in your body. And so if that tone is not being handled correctly because there's irritation of the vagus nerve due to the CCI, that can link those two together. Now there's other things as well that cause POTS. So CCI would just be one of those. Uh, Ulysses, how was the vacation? It was great. Yeah, it was good to, to get a little time off. It was good to uh, hang out on the boat and sail and all that other stuff. So yeah, uh, coming back refreshed, which is great. Can MRI miss a rotated C1? I have herniations at C2, 3 and C3, 4. And that if, can that affect vagus nerve or cause POTS? Yeah, MRI, routine MRIs generally don't look as high as C0, C1, or C2. They kind of go from C2, 3 down. So an MRI will usually miss, a routine neck MRI will usually miss problems higher up. There's other types of imaging that can look at those problems. Upright flexion extension MRI is one way to look at those issues. Another way to look at those issues would be a dedicated upper cervical MRI or a digital motion X-ray. But a routine cervical MRI uh, is really going to underperform in trying to get to a CCI diagnosis. Now, that's not to say there may not be things on there that show CCI that an expert 
can look at and determine, but that's not usually your average reading radiologist. So even if there were things on a routine cervical MRI with regard to, to this type of subfailure CCI that we're discussing here, uh, usually they will be missed uh, by a routine reading radiologist. Ulysses, I have a question, does C0 compress the jugular vein or is it just C1 to C3 only? Yeah, it would usually be C1 or C2 uh, that would compress the internal jugular vein. Uh, Smith advanced by Harry Winston. Welcome back. Thanks so much for all your posts from the book. My question is, is there a time period for the beginning of the issue in which it's best to get treatment? You know, Harry, my overall experience so far is that if we can get patients within that first year, I think, as I've said before, uh, more likely to get into a one and done type treatment. So that means uh, a single treatment and we're done. Um, and as the problem takes on a life of its own and more years go past, then we're more likely to need more treatments. And in some patients, they're getting permanent damage to those structures and may get to the point where we can't completely help because things have been going on so long. So yeah, I think earlier is better. Obviously, you've got to give everything a chance to heal, which takes months um, before you would ever consider something like this. Lissy, which ligaments in the neck are important the most? Uh, that really depends on what it is we're talking about. Um, uh, they all do different things. Um, if you look at uh, which ligament you wouldn't want to break, uh, if you put it that way, uh, you definitely wouldn't want to break the transverse ligament because that would give you an upper spinal cord injury. Uh, it's probably one of the reasons why that ligament is so unbelievably strong. Amanda, what about severe C2 rotations with one side damage to ALR and transverse? Will PICL help? Uh, Amanda, I need to know more about what you would consider severe C2 rotations. Um, but C, C1, C2 rotation is common when there's damage to the ALAR ligament because the ALAR ligament rotationally stabilizes C1 on C2. Um, so in general, PICL helps with those sorts of things, but I'd need to know more than you're describing. Uh, it's been advanced by DB. Can you have C0 spinal compression without having CCI? Sure. Yeah, that's certainly possible. Uh, be more likely to have CCI, but it's certainly possible to have a high upper cervical compression that has nothing to do with, with uh, CCI. It could be posture related in combination with congenital factors like a retroflex dens where the dens comes back much too far. Um, it could be a small frame and magnum, which is the hole at the bottom of the skull, lots of things. Daniel, uh, is PICL still classified as experimental? Why can't you share the clinic trial data public for everyone? Uh, let's see, Daniel, I've shared two different data sets so far. So we've been sharing all of that stuff as we go. Um, I would still classify PICL as experimental um, and it will be for many years, meaning that we're not teaching PICL to any physician until such time as we can get more publications out there. But we've shared two different data drops on uh, uh, information we've collected or registry information we've collected on PICL. Um, so I'm not quite sure what you're referring to there. Uh, what causes brain fog? Lots and lots and lots of different things. Obviously, uh, CCI patients can experience brain fog, but there's 20 other, 30 other, 40 other causes as well. It's been advanced by Sherry Kopp. Welcome back. And CCI causes anxiety, digestive issues, or chest pain. Well, certainly we've talked about that vagus nerve irritation, which can lead to anxiety because that's the chill out nerve uh, in the body. And hence, if you block it or irritate it, you're not going to get that parasympathetic response, which causes you to be able to relax. Um, you could get into sympathetic overdrive, which is fight or flight all the time. Uh, that would also link to digestive issues, chest pain, a little harder to pin on that particular 
problem, although there are a few publications having to do with chest pain um, through the vagus nerve, usually uh, chest pain is more commonly caused by other things than the thoracic spine. Stefan, hello, Dr. Centeno. I prepare myself for the cells and follow their diet very strictly and feel a slight improvement. Is the diet now just the kind of booster for the stem cells? So this improvement remains or is it decreased because we'll probably get used to it. Well, certainly, Stefan, we know that the sort of average Western diet, uh, where we have high carbs, high sugar intake, um, and high saturated fats intake, um, is very pro-inflammatory. Um, so the diet type of diet we recommend would be would lower systemic inflammation. So if you're feeling better with that, I would stay on that diet permanently because it also has um, or appears to have, based on the peer-reviewed literature, other health benefits, i.e. cardiac, brain, et cetera. Um, so it's great that you're feeling better by changing your diet. Keep, keep going with that. Daniel, I don't have access to AO where I live. It just heard it's important for ligament healing. Uh, yeah, Daniel, if we have somebody who is um, responsive to AO or NUCA, uh, then we definitely want them to continue it during the procedure. Now, that's not every one of our patients. Only about six in 10 of our patient population is very responsive to that. Um, we have obviously some patients that have never tried it. They don't have access to it or we have some patients it just doesn't work for at all. Um, and hence, uh, we don't recommend it if the patient hasn't tried it or uh, it doesn't work for them. Uh, as far as is it necessary uh, to get ligament healing? No, but it would be a big help, obviously, if someone was getting temporary relief from upper cervical chiropractic. Maya, can loss of neck curve cause CCI? Um, I don't know that the word cause is the right term, but it certainly acts as gasoline on the bonfire, meaning that loss of neck curve is going to put more stress on the upper cervical spine. So if you've got an upper cervical issue, it's just going to make it worse. Uh, obviously, it's far simpler to work on fixing your neck curve, and you can do that with things like CBP Chiropractic, which is uh, idealspine.com and uh, find a local provider, get the curve back, and see if your symptoms go away well before you need to do anything else. Uh, Amanda, 25 degrees with IJV compression. Um, so again, Amanda, uh, C1, C2 rotation would be common. As far as 25 degrees, I need to look at the imaging to get a better specifically what that refers to and whether or not that's also in relation uh, to some scoliosis, which is pretty common. IJV compression is something that we need to be careful about because normal people without symptoms have IJV compression as well. So about one in five uh, times when someone just goes in for neck imaging for something else, uh, they've got severe bilateral IJV compression, but no symptoms of internal jugular vein compression. One in four times, we're talking about a single side with severe compression. And one in three times, we're talking about moderate compression on both sides and no symptoms. So be very careful when someone tells you you've got IJV compression because we, it's hard to figure out whether what we're seeing on the imaging is causing your symptoms since it's very common in patients who don't have symptoms. Amanda, for PICL prep is 36 hour weekly fast, best to maximize on cell count. Um, listening, uh, I think fasting can be helpful. Um, and if you wanted to do a 36 hour fast prior, I think that would be just fine. Uh, there's some limited data that shows that that could help stem cells, that could help metabolic activity, healing, et cetera. Um, so that would be, would, would be fine. Is it absolutely necessary? Uh, no, we'll generally have patients fast anyway from the night before. So they're, they're pretty much all coming in in some state of fasting. Listen, a lot of doctors saying ailer ligament is the common cause of CCI just because someone had instability in the back. Ulysses, I'm not quite sure 
what you mean or what, what question you're trying to get to. So if you could rephrase that, that'd be great. Uh, Maya, can building up neck muscle improve CCI? Um, yeah, so instability, Maya, is half uh, muscles and half ligaments. So anytime we can try to get the patient stronger and, and the patient will respond positively, that's a net positive. So definitely seeing a physical therapist working on neck strengthening is a good first step, just like working on getting the curve back is a good first step. Now, some CCI patients can't tolerate any kind of strengthening. So if you crash and burn with strengthening, you may need more workup to see if you do have uh, more significant craniocervical instability, but obviously you should def definitely give that a shot. Man, how does C rotation affect low back, muscle by pain and low back on one side? Um, it probably doesn't directly affect your low back. Then now there may be indirect effects proprioceptively, um, but you know, that needs to be looked at. Meaning, do you have scoliosis? Um, do you have other issues going on in the low back? Um, all of that would need to be looked at separately and then together to see if there's a connection between the two. We do know uh, that uh, patients with chronic neck issues have their lumbar stabilizers go offline. So that can be one cause of problems in the low back and patients with chronic neck problems. Let's see, tex neck is another cause of CCI2. Probably not a cause, but again, not, not helping. Uh, Sunshine Weird, hi, Dr. C. Hey, Sunshine. The recent DMX showing that my overhang has not changed much from the previous DMX a year earlier. Earlier DMX is seen that I had less range of motion in lateral flexion, but a much improved range of motion in the most recent. Does better range of motion show a true measurement of an overhang? Yeah, Sunshine, we've seen that before. And it's one of the reasons why when you see me look at overhangs and compare them, I'm always looking to compare the amount of range of motion the person has because we will see, especially in hypermobile patients or in patients with ligament injury, that the more range of motion they get, the more instability they have. So obviously, if we've got two DMXs that show similar amounts of instability, one with a lot more range of motion, that probably indicates an improvement in the instability. Uh, Daniel, I have asymmetric widening of the lateral ADI interval, and that's due to one or both alar ligament. Wouldn't it be better to just inject the damaged ligament instead of both? Um, yeah, Daniel, so the, so if you're talking about static asymmetrical widening, uh, that can be due to lots of different things, not only alar ligament injury. Uh, if you're talking about uh, dynamic, meaning on a digital motion x-ray, then we might only inject one um, uh, if there's absolutely no evidence that the other is involved. Isabella, what is the difference between PRP and, and platelet lysate in terms of what is better for nerve healing regeneration? Um, in our clinical experience, platelet lysate is less pro-inflammatory. So patients tend to tolerate it better and it seems to work well around nerves just clinically. Uh, there's now a good amount of research showing that PRP itself will help with nerve and nerve problems. The most uh, well-studied area is carpal tunnel syndrome. So either one, I think, can be a net positive towards helping nerves. Isabel, do you have exercises for strength in the neck? We, we do, Isabella. Uh, Carla, my assistant, has those. They're also online at the CentennialSchultz.com uh, website. Stefan, uh, thank you very much. I feel that the diet, uh, I feel that with the diet, what you said, what I still wanted to ask, I feel asleep, fell asleep when I woke up with vertigo, can see as positional vertigo. Yeah, so the upper cervical spine is heavily linked into balance. So we have proprioceptors or position sensors in the upper cervical spine that help to provide information that has to be consistent with visual information and inner ear information. So the answer is yes. Uh, we certainly can see um, patients with upper cervical problems get dizzy because of bad information coming from the upper neck. 
uh, Isabella, would PRP or platelet lysate better for healing of the occipital nerves? We normally use platelet lysate simply because it's it's less pro-inflammatory. Um, and we're always concerned in patients with upper cervical syndromes about causing too much flare-up with the procedure itself. So in those cases, we would use platelet lysate and not PRP uh, just to try to avoid that PRP flare-up that you can get with injecting around nerves. Listen, there's a bunch of weights called the halo posture where it can help people curve and posture and should you work with this provider too? You know, I don't really, I, at least from talking to CCI patients, it seems like the weights are really poorly tolerated. Um, and this makes sense given what we're dealing with. Um, so my, my sense is that, well, I, that's one of the reasons why I don't recommend the weights. I would much rather you see a well-trained uh, chiropractic biophysics specialist uh, who can work with different vectors of uh, pull to try to get the correct curve back. Um, I think the weights are meant to be sort of a home solution, um, but my concern is they seem to be poorly tolerated by most of the CCI patients that I've spoken to that have tried them. Isabella, thanks so much and hope you have a nice, vac right now, a nice vacation. Thank you. Maya, can you please explain more exactly what narrowing of C7T1 is? The same as herniation and can it cause thoracic muscle tension? Yeah, Maya, we just need to know a little bit more about what is narrowed. Are we talking about central canal narrowing, foraminal stenosis, um, ligament and flavum hypertrophy, narrowing due to a disc bulge, narrowing due to osteophytes or bone spurs? So. Uh, not able to answer that question because it's a little too general. The ADI was seen on T2 sagittal view. Uh, you can see an ADI on T2 sagittal view with an MRI. It's not the best way to measure it because it's very hard to uh, determine the, the cortex and where the cortex lives and starts and ends on most MRI images. It's actually easier to see on either an X-ray, a DMX or a CT scan. Uh, you see some patients prove the weights and some don't because they still have instability in the neck, but have you seen these type of weights before? Yeah, Ulysses, I'd say I've probably observed a few dozen patients who have CCI try them. And as I've said, they've been pretty poorly tolerated so far by the patients I've talked to. Stefan, I would like to thank you very much for your information because we get this very diff different here in Germany. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Stefan. Yeah, I know we've got a big uh, contingent of German patients now following uh, due to uh, the fact that I did an interview. And um, that's great to see. Uh, it's great to see. I just talked to a German patient this morning. So it's great to see all the interest from Germany uh, for this kind of problem. And again, as I always say, and the reason for, for me getting online twice a week is trying to make sure that patients remain educated. Because I got to tell you, and as you probably know, I mean, I, I, I've gone on Facebook groups just to see what's out there. And uh, I have been just uh, disheartened by the stuff I see being uh, bantied around a Facebook groups. Now here, thankfully, you guys have got a fantastic Facebook group that Dan Semrad put together um, on PICL and CCI. But you go outside of that safe environment that Dan has created and that science-based and clinically-based environment into some of these other Facebook groups, and it's crazy out there. So the goal here is to try to keep patients educated continually talk about these issues, try to make sure that patients learn what's going on um, and learn which questions to ask their providers, because that's a good part of this, right? Uh, knowing the right questions to ask. You know, I, as you know, many of you know, I was on a sailboat for six weeks, right? And, you know, we're still learning the ropes um, about what are the right questions to ask about certain parts and pieces of the boat? Uh, 
And God, it makes a big difference. Uh, obviously having that extensive experience and, and knowing, oh, I should be asking this guy about this and you know the mechanic about that and the guy doing the sales about this other thing. And obviously when you start something, you don't know what the right questions are to ask. So you're missing lots of great information that you should be able to get or that a more experienced person can get. So that's the goal here. Isabella, what exactly is the difference between PRP and plate lysate? And what's the difference in producing both? Yeah, so Isabella PRP stands for platelet rich plasma. So that's where we concentrate platelets in plasma. And um, it generally is considered to work by the platelets releasing uh, both growth factors through what are called alpha vesicles over time. Um, and exosomes, which are little snippets of information uh, for communication between cells. Uh, a platelet lysate is a little different in that in a platelet lysate, you break open the platelets and get all of the growth factors and exosomes out. So the main difference is almost like a time release pill for PRP and that over time it's releasing those growth factors and, and exosomes. Uh, versus an immediate release pill for platelet lysate, where all the stuff is out and able to be used at once. Uh, they're produced very differently. PRP is produced via concentration. Uh, for platelet lysate, you first make PRP and then you lyse or break open the platelets. Thatcher, the supine CT scan for this type of instability is done with neck, left, right, neutral in one go. Or if you have a neutral CT scan the before, then you scan the neck, left, right is sufficient. Um, you know, the rotational CTs are interesting in that we have some normals that are published. Uh, I find that they are low likelihood of being positive when it comes to C1C2. Now, looking at C0C1, we're more likely to see a positive on a rotational CT scan, if that's the question. But when it comes to C1C2, I rarely see patients who have more than 56 degrees of rotation at C1-C2, which is uh, the definition of instability by Dvorak. Maya, discrete posterior narrowing of the intervertebral space of C7-T1 was told by physio it might be a herniation. My surgeon didn't explain it to me. There's no compression on spinal cord on the MRI. So it sounds like there's some disc space narrowing posteriorly and the back of the disc. So what they're saying is the back part of the disc is narrowed compared to the front part of the disc. Uh, that can be due to long-term bad posture. That could, could be due to an injury to the disc itself. Um, obviously, as we get older, and from your picture, you look pretty young, uh, but as we get older, that can also happen due to degenerative disease. But that's what they're talking about, which is not really the kind of narrowing we were discussing before, the kind of narrowing I was discussing had to do with narrowing around the nerves or the spinal cord. The kind of narrowing you're discussing is there's a part of the disc uh, that has lost some height. Okay, questions, Isabella. Uh, is it bad to treat the occipital nerves with regular PRP and will the healing be the same once inflammation decreases? It's certainly not bad to inject PRP around the nerves. We've got a lot of good research around nerves that it seems to be helpful. Um, like I said, the biggest thing we always get concerned about with CCI patients uh, or upper cervical patients is that we can cause a flare up. Um, but if you can tolerate the flare up, then there's no downside to it uh, based on what's been published uh, so far. Any other questions here uh, for me to answer? Happy to answer them. Fatchen, uh, should a CBCT scan uh, be used more of diagnosis since you can do flexion extension rotation CT in one go instead of upright MRI and CT rotation? I haven't seen much CBCT be used with movement. I think they do a little of that at the Barcelona Clinic but I haven't seen it used much here in the U.S. with movement. Um, so I think an upright MRI for me would be more helpful and I'd get more information uh, from that. Um, rotational CT, I'm always happy to look at, but I don't get quite as much information 
meaning it's lower likelihood to diagnose uh, CCI just based on a rotational CT. Um, and as I always discuss, you know, the, if we look at types of imaging and the likelihood of getting to a CCI diagnosis, if it's there, digital motion x-ray is usually the one that is the highest likelihood of getting to that diagnosis. Delisi, oh, by the way, if I a provider last month in New York City knows about CCI and also has DSA-2 because you can treat some of Dr. Hauser patients too, but you look at images and notice. Um, not quite sure what's being said there, but it sounds like uh, you found a provider who uses digital subtraction and geography, maybe doing upper cervical facets, uh, which is great. Because um, uh, as we always talk about, uh, fluoroscopy and digital subtraction and geography are essential components of doing a safe C0, C1, or C1, C2 facet injection. And then we get into the next phase of discussing the amount of time of, and experience in doing those. So I'd like to see a provider who's doing at least 100 of those procedures each year um, in order to uh, say that that person is competent and experienced enough to do those on a regular basis. So that's be the next question to ask there. Uh, curve is bad too. Uh, Laura uh, Rinda Drake, can PRP help a capture ligament injury? Um, it can, but we need to be a little bit careful with that discussion because I see a lot of capsular injuries diagnosed on DMX that are really nothing more than standard degenerative uh, disc disease and degenerative instability and are not pathologic, but they're put in the report. Um, so I think we tend to see over-reporting of normal degenerative instability uh, described that way on a digital motion x-ray. Um, but a PR, or PRP can help the capsular ligaments, but we need to be careful to make sure that we need to treat the capsular ligaments because I see wide over-reporting of that on DMX reports um, when there's really, we're really not looking at abnormalities, we're just looking at standard changes with aging. Other questions I can answer, any out there? So just to start reviewing what we were talking about today, we were talking about CCI uh, type 1D. So that's the rotational instability of the skull on the atlas um, and uh, how that's defined and the ligaments we might want to treat. There's some more questions that came in there. Isabella, what do you think about PRP kits and the quality of PRP it produces? Have you heard from the brand Dr. PRP? Uh, yeah, Dr. PRP is awful based on what I've seen so far. Um, uh, listen, the biggest problem with using PRP kits to date has been uh, they vary uh, extremely wildly in quality. Uh, and what I mean by quality is their ability to produce higher concentrations of platelets. Um, so, for example, um, if you look at the published research, Arthrex ACP um, barely concentrates platelets over baseline. Uh, Regen Lab is one that barely concentrates platelets over baseline. Um, at the other end of that spectrum, we have kits out there uh, that can produce pretty good concentrations, I would say mid-range concentrations of PRP in a single spin. Um, so m -Site produces a kit like that, which is good quality PRP based on what I've seen. Then you've got what you can do in a lab, which is quite different. You can push the concentrations even higher, which is why to date, since we haven't seen a kit that can produce high quality PRP at high concentrations, we do all of our work in a lab where we can get to those higher concentrations. Now that may change in time. Someone may come out with a fantastic knock my socks off kit that can produce super high concentrations. I just haven't seen it yet. Uh, Maya, can CCI happen all of a sudden? What exactly causes it? Uh, Maya, the two most common causes would either be trauma to the head or neck, or uh, we also see patients with hypermobile EDS get minor trauma um, 
or something happens that causes it to be symptomatic. Fat check, powers, powers ratio, 1.1 measuring extension. X-ray means the skull is slipped backwards, which ligaments are usually the culprit. Chiropractor, where I did the test, mentioned it to me again. Yeah, so there you're looking at the movement of the skull on the uh, upper cervical spine. Um, it's possible that that represents the skull has moved backwards. I'd need to look at the images to make sure. Another way to look at that, if it's on a flexion extension MRI, um, or if there's flexion extension CT, CBCT, as you were talking about, would be how does the clivus um, align to the dens? And when the person goes back, does the clivus go back more than one millimeter as compared to the neutral? Uh, so that's another way to get to that diagnosis, uh, simpler than calculating a powers ratio. The problem with the powers ratio is that once you do the math, you're kind of diluting the movement. Um, so it's harder to see. But if you just look at, draw a line from the clivus down to the posterior inferior corner of C2, you can get a better sense of whether or not you've got movement relative to the dens. Daniel, do you see different between these patients groups? Do you know, not quite sure which patient groups you're referring to there. So let me, uh, let me know. Uh, da Daniel, I know you guys have done a blind trial, but you call it some patients rejected. Yep, we are still in the middle of that trial. Uh, that trial is ongoing. Gamers, um, new in here for CCI diagnosis, to me made is flexion extension upright MRI needed on a regular upright MRI for those of you who have a spine and shall suffice. Um, yeah, so uh, the starting place would be just a routine cervical MRI. The problem with a routine cervical MRI is that would be the lowest likelihood of showing CCI if it's present. Uh, if you had a flexion extension upright MRI, we up the odds of being able to see CCI if it's present. And the highest odds of seeing CCI if it's present would be a digital motion X-ray. Not sure what that one means. Uh, gamers, procedures taking place in countries like UK, Belgium in the future. Um, no time soon um, is that going to happen. Uh, uh, we just had a, a physician um, in Eastern Europe who wanted to start offering PICL. We declined. Uh, and the reason is that we've got a lot to get published on this before we can get there. Uh, and we need to get all of that information in the peer reviewed literature before we would feel comfortable teaching someone how to do this. In addition, there's lots and lots of parts and pieces that most providers don't have that they'd have to add. So for example, most providers, as we've talked about, don't have digital subtraction angiography, which would be required to do this kind of work. Um, most providers don't have dual, dual fluoroscopes or two fluoroscopes to use at once, which would be required to do the higher level versions of this. Most providers don't have a 3D printed mouthpiece that we've created to keep the tongue out of the way and then you can x-ray through. Most providers don't have endoscopy, which is needed to uh, create a sterile field. Most pro you can just go down that list. Most providers don't have a lab that they can use that has CGMP air handling to keep the cells sterile. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So we will get there at some point, but there's going to be a lot of caveats and a lot of things that those providers will have to add. So that will reduce the number of providers willing to do this um, because the safety components that we will require will be huge. Uh, best of Runscape, have you ever seen any connection between CCI and tethered cord issues? Um, well, I think we're talking about not tethered cord, but occult tethered cord. Um, so occult tethered cord is a pretty controversial diagnosis. 99.9% .9 of neurosurgeons would not believe that it exists. Um, so for the 0.1% of neurosurgeons that believe it exists, um, there would theoretically be a connection with what we would call a CCI type 1A, where we're seeing... Axial angle causing upward pressure 
on the spinal cord. Now, there'd be two camps there. There's one camp that has published saying that wouldn't do it because the spinal cord itself is fungible or elastic enough to take up that slack without any problems. We'd have another group uh, in that controversy who would say, no, that, that causes a cult tethered cord. So pretty controversial there, um, but uh, if there is a connection, it would be with that low clavoaxial angle CCI type 1A. Faction, how do you diagnose a problem with tectoral membrane, ligament, what type of CCI is that? Uh, so it depends on what kind of instability it causes, but uh, one of the things it could cause would be uh, that when you bring your head back this way, um, you're seeing too high of a clivoaxial angle. So a CCI type 1B um, would be associated with a tectorial membrane issue. So remember, a tectorial membrane is one of those membranes in the front. So if it's loose, you're going to have problems with skull extension. Thatchin, what main ligament would keep CCI from slipping forward? Is slipping forward is a realistic thing. So there we're on, talking about CCI, for example, type 1A or 2A. So for a 2A, that would be a transverse ligament injury. Uh, for a 1A, um, we'd be talking about ligament, ligaments back here that are injured, things like the nuchal ligament, things like the vertebral dural ligament, those sorts of uh, things. Gamers, I appreciate your response to my previous query. How are we supposed to see if you guys, if we have, see you guys if we have balance issues? Because we're not, uh, I think there's more down here. And because we cannot travel an airplane recommendations here. Um, yeah, it's good. Good question. I'm not quite sure I can answer that question for you. Uh, best I can tell you is what's available. Edwin, have you guys ever considered getting into PRP for hair? We're saying a big money maker. Yeah, Edwin, uh, listen, there's lots of things we don't do that could potentially make lots and lots of money. Um, cosmetic PRP, hair regrowth PRP, sexual function PRP. We've got physicians out there who are injecting PRP into penises and vaginas and all this other stuff. You know, um, one of the things that has formed the bedrock of our practice is we stay within the areas where we have expertise, even if that means that we're ignoring potential big money makers. Um, so I've ignored all of that um, primarily because I've got no expertise in hair. I've got no expertise in cosmetics. I've got no expertise in sexual dysfunction as a physician. So adding those areas to me is unethical for my practice because I don't have expertise in those areas. Daniel, do you know that there's a clinic in India that does a very similar procedure of PICL? Um, yeah, Daniel, we've seen that clinic uh, try it once. They gave it a shot. I critiqued it. So you may want to go back and look at the Chinese hamburger uh, video I did. Well, let's see, six weeks plus maybe six weeks. So maybe three months ago, something like that. Um, where they made all sorts of really uh, not good mistakes. Uh, so they tried to see if they could replicate it. Um, but in my opinion, it was done in an unsafe manner. Um, so um, listen, I'm sure there's going to be lots of people trying to replicate what we're doing without the dual C-arms, without the specialized 3D printed mouthpiece, without endoscopy, without digital subtraction, all that stuff. I, I can't control that. All I can control is what we do and obviously at this point the extensive experience we have in, in keeping patients safe with this procedure. Anna, I have mostly a lot of upper neck pain and some occasional headaches, vision issues, and brain fog. I don't notice a heavy or unstable head or imbalance like most patients. Could this still be CCI? Um, it certainly could. Um, you know, a heavy or unstable head or imbalance aren't requirements. They're just common things reported by CCI, but we certainly see CCI patients without those components. 
Anne Marie, uh, can CCI cause vomiting? There are times when I feel like my head is tilted in the wrong direction and I throw up. Um, it can for sure uh, cause nausea slash vomiting, um, meaning that, as you know, if you um, have uh, seasickness, uh, you can vomit. Uh, and that's a disconnect between uh, what your visual field is seeing as far as the world moving up and down and what your inner ear is telling you regarding the world moving up and down. So those mismatches between systems, and in this case, what the neck is saying versus what the inner ear is reporting can certainly cause nausea and vomiting. Sylvia, do you ever see insurance covering PRP or other regen procedures? Um, Listen, we've got insurance coverage now with more than a thousand U.S. companies through Regenix. Um, so, for example, if you're a State Farm employee, um, this is all covered uh, as we're talking here today. Um, 7-Eleven employees, this is all covered. Um, so what we're discussing here is covered company by company. Now, as far as getting blanket coverage through United Healthcare, Cigna, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, that's still many years away. But as far as companies by company, uh, many big companies and Fortune 500 companies are starting to realize that this stuff saves money. So they're adding it individually to their health plans. Um, so that's regrettably a company by company basis. But for those patients, it's completely covered. Ulysses, bone spurs from C1 dash C1, maybe C1, C2. Can affect the spinal cord or just stabilize the Johnny because of the instability. Not sure what's being asked there, Ulysses. Gamers, do you guys think the PSEL type procedure approaches would be applicable to Eagle syndrome or calcification and styloid somewhere in the future? Um, I've got a whole blog on that. Uh, if you go to the Regenix.com website, uh, probably better to do that. Let me see if I can pull that up for you to show you where it lives. Uh, let's see here. Let's see if I can pull up that blog and then share it. And guys, I've got about only eight minutes left just because I have a hard two o'clock um, that I've got to get to a meeting. Um, but let me share my screen here. So if you go to the Regenix.com website, uh, two X's, R-A-G-E-N-E-X-X, -X, uh, you can see uh, that there is an Eagle Syndrome blog. Uh, and it talks about all the things that we're discussing here. So again, just be a little careful because a calcified styloid is common in patients without any symptoms. So just having a calcified styloid doesn't really mean much. Um, it's very, very common in people walking around who've never had a day of issues in their lives. Um, then we get into uh, why is it calcified and how that can interact with craniocervical instability. So probably better um, to go to the Regenex, R-E-G-E-N-E-X-X.com website, look up Eagle syndrome, and that'll be described in there. Uh, finally, is there a link between reassessed jaw and CCI? Not that I know of, um, if you mean uh, a small mandible. Maya, can one have CCI and still be able to do neck flexion without pain? Um, yeah, Maya, so main symptoms of CCI, if you go to the same website and you just type in CCI symptoms, uh, those will come up. Um, so uh, those are CCI, common CCI symptoms there. The larger words uh, correspond to more common complaints from CCI patients. Um, then Anne Marie, I'm trying to skip around here a little bit, see if I can get people's questions answered. Anne Marie, how many PSL treatments on average typically prior for CCI and how far apart are they done? 
prisoners that need trial for treatments. I'm curious if it's multiple trips required if patients stay in the ER for a period of time. Yeah, so Emory, uh, it's usually two to four treatments for the average patient. Normally, those are three to four months apart. So not really practical to stay in the area. Uh, so patients generally come and then go back. Uh, Edwin, if I'm getting Regenix on my lower body, would putting Voltaren gel on the other leg for another injury interfere with like oral NSAIDs would? Probably less, but you're still going to get some blood levels of Voltaren, and there's still going to be some blocking of the acute inflammatory response. So uh, less of an issue, but still probably a little issue. Okay, guys, well, I'm going to start wrapping it up since I've got to get to a hard two o'clock uh, mountain time on my side. Um, number one, uh, it's great to see you all back here again and to answer your questions. Um, I will be here Friday with uh, another topic and uh, love all the questions, love answering the questions. Um, and hopefully you guys get stuff out of this and, and learn because that's the goal. Um, thanks so much for for watching today. I will be here on Friday, uh, same bat time, same bat channel, and I will see you then. So thank you very much.